Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are uh, just now going to be getting um, waiting for one more minute as more people are hopping on. All right. So to get started with our uh, Zoom etiquette, we ask that you submit all of your questions via the question and answer box uh, in the feature below. Uh, we will do our best to answer all the questions in the time allotted, and we have uh, a guest speaker with us today who we'll introduce soon. We also have additional resources on our website, and we, we will uh, provide, um, after this Q&A session, an email with a recording of all these questions here today. And so uh, if you have any technical difficulties, though, we do ask that you put that in the webinar chat. But for all of your personal questions about RFA, the question and answer box. Thank you so much for joining us today. But first, would you introduce yourself, Travis? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of problem starting my video, but uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name's Travis Trueblood. I serve as the general counsel for NAF. Uh, so I know there might be some questions about uh, legal questions about how to put together some aspects of the, the grant application and the agreement and things like that. So I'll be here today to answer some of those questions as they come up along the way. Thanks for the opportunity to introduce myself. Yes, for sure. All right. And so now we're going to go ahead and go into the questions and answer period. So if you have any questions uh, for us today, go ahead and submit that and then we'll start reading them out. We, we appreciate you all being here. Also, um, we can give a chance for our team to introduce ourselves as well. So Chanel Ford, our Director of Programs, is on the line. Uh, my name is Whitney Sani. I'm the Director of Communications and Policy. We appreciate you being here. I know we're getting close to the deadline, uh, but we're here really just to be uh, as a support to you as you navigate the application answer any questions about eligibility, uh, but also um, just wanted you all to know that um, previous webinars that we um, were able to do as part of our, our uh, lead up to this request for application period, uh, we have a presentation that's recorded and you can find that on the website and in a little bit we'll go through um, just a, an overview of the website so you can see where that lives on the web page. But I'll let uh, Chanel just give a quick introduction of herself. Just kidding, I was on mute. Um, yes, hello, thank you so much, Whitney. My name is Chanel Ford. I am the Director of Programs here at NAF. And um, as Whitney shared, we do have pre-recorded webinars that go thoroughly um, over, our, our, over our RFA um, for the 2024 um, funding cycle. We are in our sixth year of funding. I'm really excited to see the incoming applications. Uh, just as a note, um, our RFA closes on May 1st. And typically, focus areas of our funding, um, if you need a refresher, um, are that of... Um, uh, goodness gracious, strategic planning activities, um, talking about um, specific ways that you can enhance access to capital, create access to capital, um, uh, production increase in your communities or your region. Uh, and we know that every region looks different, um, that farming and ranching, agriculture looks different. So really honing in on that in your applications and, and sharing with us how that's touching back to agriculture is really important. Um, and as Whitney shared, we go in depth about this on our uh, prior um, webinars. So what to expect, how we score the applications, um, and specifics on each um, entity that's eligible to apply. So as a refresher, we um, eligible entities to apply for our funding are 501c3s, CDFIs, tribes and instrumentalities, and educational institutions. Um, we're really happy that we do have Travis on the call today. Um, as we've shared in the past, um, the one of the trickier documents has to deal with um, the 
eligible entity of the tribe. So the tribes, when they apply, they are required to submit a, a limited sovereign immunity waiver. And I know there are questions about that and, and um, concerns sometimes as to how long um, uh, that waiver uh, has to stand for and just specifics and logistics behind it. So we do have Travis here. And that document is only applicable um, to our tribal um, grantees. So if you're applying via a tribe, then that would uh, apply to you. So um, thank you all for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the questions. And um, as a side note as well, please refer back to uh, our website. Um, we have a whole list of FAQs that we've gone through. If something isn't answered here today, or if you're going through the application and you have more questions that, that we didn't discuss, um, please refer back to that. We also were able to assist by you submitting questions if they aren't answered today or if you uh, do come across them when you're applying for the funding. Um, if you submit your questions to our grants at nativeamericanagriculturefund.org, uh, Jess Morago will go through all of those questions and um, get them answered appropriately. I will also flag that we do our best to answer these questions and um, unfortunately, the day of um, the due date of the application, if you're submitting a question, um, you know, 30 minutes to, um, to closing of the application, the likelihood of that being answered is, is probably not as high. So we encourage you all to get any questions to us um, uh, with enough um, time for us to get you a sufficient answer. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chanel. I see we have some questions coming in. So just as a reminder to go ahead and submit your questions to the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, a number, another member of our program team, Graham Gaither, and we'll walk through some of these questions. We Again, we have a number of our, our team standing by, so we'll also try to do our best to respond in writing as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Gaither. I'm a member of the program team. I've been with NAP for just over four years now. So um, really enjoyed my work here. And I'm going to be go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start leading our question and answering phase. We do have two open questions in our Q&A box. I recommend that any of the other participants, if you have any questions, please do pose them in the Q&A box. For any of you who are here on a cell phone, please note that uh, we will be reading all questions uh, verbally. So even if it is submitted and answered, uh, through a typed response by one of our staff members, we will still read that question on air and answer it on air as well. So the first question comes from Joy and says, we are a native Hawaiian serving university, but it seems that the application forms have many mandatory sections selections that we do not fall under. Would that be an issue for eligibility? And I do want to note that we have several uh, native Hawaiian organizations, 501c3s, etc. And Native Hawaiians are, there's no issue in eligibility. Um, so if you are having specific issues with a question, then I do recommend that you reach out to grants at nativeamericanagriculturefund.org with the specific question that might be giving you some issues. That way you can get some targeted technical assistance. But please know that you are eligible and we welcome your application. The next question is from uh, Christina. My main concern is navigating found it and getting prompted to move along the virtual application. And so our applications every single year are hosted on the found it grant management website. And so the application is virtual, although I will also say that we do have offline versions that you can review in a Word document or PDF located on our website. So for anyone who hasn't started yet, that's a good first way to see if you're interested in looking at the application and seeing what it looks like. But if you are having any specific issues or navigating that found in system, I also recommend that you reach out to grants at nativeamericanagriculturefund.org. And that way you can get some more targeted technical assistance. Hey, Graham, I'm also going to jump in here on that question. I'm going to drop in the chat a link to a document. And as we go through the website in, in a little bit, 
you'll see there's options to, as Graham mentioned, to download some of the applications ahead of time, but there's also a resource that is an RFA found in application tutorial. So I will drop that into the chat there. Thank you, Whitney. Okay, I see a question from Eduardo that says, we are a tribal college. Do you have a template for the application? And as I mentioned, we do have templates for the application located on our website. We have them both in a Word document format and a PDF format. And you can download those and review those offline at any time. The next question is anonymous. They say, our tribe has a currently funded project. We did submit a report late. Does that make us ineligible to apply for funding in fiscal year 2024? Also, we have an existing extension on our current Corral project and would like to know if it's possible to get a second extension on our current project award. Um, so that I'm gonna split that question up into two pieces. The first is, does submitting a report late make you ineligible to apply as a current grantee? And I'm going to say no. Um, there is a compliance eligibility piece and I do recommend reaching out to your point of contact. Um, if you could mail uh, message me directly and let me know what organization you are. Uh, I do see that you're posing this question anonymously, but if you could message me specifically, I can pass on your question over to your point of contact and have them get in touch with you. And that also applies to the extension question as well. That could be answered by your point of contact. One more anonymous question. If we apply to all three focus areas, which is the general focus plus both special focus areas, could we hypothetically apply for a total of $600,000 if we were requesting the max allotment for each? And the question, uh, the answer ultimately is that you can uh, receive the max for each um, project type. So every project type has a minimum and maximum amount let's say that the maximum amount is 200,000 for each and you apply for three, then that would net you 600,000, assuming that all three projects are uh, funded the full amount. What I will say though, is that NAF does have an expectation that each project that you apply for is able to stand on its own. If you are applying for three projects and all three of them are interdependent to the point where if one doesn't get funded, the other two can't work, then that is going to be part of our decision-making process when we evaluate. So please do ensure that every project that you apply for, even if it's three focus areas, each focus area must be able to stand on its own. Okay, how important, oh, this next one is from Abigail. How important are partnerships in application scoring? We plan to get other groups involved, but can't yet speak for their participation. And I will answer this and effectively say it depends because in a lot of ways, it's going to depend on your area, on what your objectives are. There's no wrong or right way to bring in partnerships. But what I will say is that we take every project and score it and evaluate it as it is. So um, in the context of what you're trying to get done and what your community looks like, I think that getting lots of strong partnerships is really fantastic. Um, so, but please know that if you don't have those really strong partnerships, we're not going to immediately uh, not fund your project. It's really about what are you able to get done and what are you trying to get done? Okay, now I do see that uh, we do have some questions over in the chat. I would like to uh, urge all participants to please put questions in the Q&A, but I will go ahead and read those that are in the chat right now. Um, so one was about the partnerships and we just answered that. Okay, so that was the one in the chat. So we do have one more now in our Q&A. We work with multiple Native Hawaiian-owned and operated ranches. 
Can our application include our collaborations with all the ranches, or should we focus on one project from just one ranch? Uh, and to that, I would say it again is context dependent. It depends on the size of the ranch. It depends on a lot of factors, how involved are they in the project? And I think that the best response I can give you is that work with the number of ranches that is going to take your impact as far as it can go while staying reasonable in terms of time, timeline, budget, et cetera. So more is not always better than one. One is not always better than more. It really depends on what your specific use case is. Okay, for each focus area that we are applying to, do we need a separate budget and budget narrative? Going along the lines of what I'd mentioned earlier about each project needing to stand on its own, each one also does need to have a separate budget and budget narrative. So as you go through the application in Foundant, you'll notice that if you apply for, for example, three different focus areas, you are effectively filling out three applications. Each one will have its own narrative, its own budget, budget narrative, impact uh, projection. And so, yes, each focus area will need a separate budget and budget narrative to be uploaded. And we also had another question come through. Um, and just so I will kind of keep it um, general here. I think in the, the the attendee was able to provide specifics on the name of the tribe um, and the grant. But generally, the question is um, they have a current project funded with NAF that has an extension that ends of July. 2024. However, the grantee is concerned that it will not be completed by this, the extension deadline. May they apply for another extension for this project? Um, so I don't know if Chanel is on the line. I think she was also going to provide just a quick overview of those who are here uh, on our current compliance requirements this year that, have, that are newer. So Chanel, would you maybe touch base on that? And then we'll connect with this grantee specifically um, offline. <clears throat> Sure. So just in terms of the, you, if you are a current grantee, you would have gotten an email um, sent out um, a little over a month ago and just recently from your POCs reminding you that if you are not in compliance, so that means behind on quarterly reports, annual reports, and final reporting, um, then you may not be in, that would count you as not being in compliance and may put you as ineligible to apply for 2024 RFA funding. So it's very important that you reach out to your point of contact because there are some instances where um, some of y'all are, say, waiting on your final report, but actually you're, you asked for a modification and you're waiting for your modification to be approved and that will impact your final report. That would push your final report out. So um, communicating that with your POC um, so we can address that is very important. So that would put you in a different category because we would then know, okay, once this modification is approved, this actually extends this, this specific process project out for another six months, which would mean your final report would be wouldn't be due um, on the said deadline. So just for a note here, um, the 501c3 point of contact is Graham Gaither. So if you're a 501c3 and you're a current grantee and you have questions, um, they would be you would be able to reach out to Graham. So all of those um, emails that have been sent out from points of contact come from those inboxes. So Graham would be sending you emails from the 501 at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. And so um, please keep your eye out for that. It may have gone, maybe it had gone to junk mail if you um, haven't received it. But we had a deadline of today to get up to date on all past reports. And so as long as you are reaching out to your point of contact and you're actively working on getting those reports completed, um, then, then we can discuss how to get you into good standing and put you in a good space to be able to apply for um, the 2024 funding. If you are an educational institution, um, a current grantee, your point of contact would be Dr. Joe Graham, and it would also be Riley Dizitel. They run the EduOrg inbox. If you are a CDFI, 
I would be your point of contact. Your emails would be coming from CDFI at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. And if you are a tribe or instrumentality, your point of contact would be Cindy Farley, and the emails would be coming from tribes at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. And we can pop those in here. Um, but the important thing is to reach out to your um, POC. They, I know, um, have been reaching out to all entities that are behind, so it shouldn't be come as a surprise to you. But we will uh, work with you to get everybody in a good space. Thank you very much, Chanel. I appreciate uh, the expanding on that, the inbox system. And, and Linda, I hope that does give you some guidance there. Uh, I'm going to continue answering some of these questions. This next one comes from Joy. It says, may I ask the indirect or overhead policy of this grant and NAF in general? And I want to, I'm going to uh, ask that you go over to our website. We do have another document that fully details the indirect uh, cost requirements and policies for NAF. Um, ultimately, it is, you can take a maximum of 15% um, applied towards the personnel and direct costs categories. So add together personnel costs with your direct costs and then multiply by that times 15%. That's the maximum in indirect costs that you can apply to your grant. But the information that we have on our website is going to be fully clear and it gives you all that information in that one document. Oh, and you can also see uh, that we just posted in the chat our budget guidelines. So that's where you can get that information. Next, we have a question that says, can you explain a little more about the project response to national disruption section of the grant application? What are you trying to gauge with this section since it's not impacting our application evaluation? And I'm going to pose an answer here, but I think it would also be really helpful to hear from Chanel or Whitney on this as well. And ultimately, it's that we are trying to see if your project is addressing an issue in your community that is systemic, or is it addressing an issue in your community that is more recent, such as coming from a drought? Is it coming from COVID? Is it a response to a timely issue? And that helps give us some context on what your project is and what type of harms it's trying to address. Yeah, Graham, I think that is spot on. It's really for us to gauge um, what we're looking at in terms of your project, because um, this may not apply to um, every region. This may not apply to every applicant and every project. Uh, so we really want to be able to hone in on what that nat nat national disruption looked like if it impacted you um, and, and how you look to um, hopefully create opportunity from that and what how that's impacted your region or your area and disrupted your um, maybe your uh, normal agricultural processes and then a plan on how you um, can see that moving forward and what is the need um, to help move that project forward in this particular instance. Thank you. Next, for the youth program, is it seen or scored more favor favorably to regrant or offer scholarships to participants instead of providing stipends during and for ag training activities in the grant period? And once again, I'll have to say it really is context dependent, but I will also add that we have a pretty good diversity of grants that do both of those. And so I think it's going to depend on what you're comfortable with, you and your organization, and what your community needs are. I'd recommend leaning more into whichever one that you feel is a strength for your organization and which one has the most need, especially the need that you can substantiate from your community. Okay, this next one. Um, says, hello, I am Augustus. I am uh, from 
uh, Kosheris Farms Limited in Nigeria, West Africa. Are we eligible to apply for the grant to enable us to sustain our outgrower scheme? And uh, unfortunately, Native American Agriculture Fund only grants two projects within the United States, um, including Alaska and Hawaii. Thank you, Graham. And as we have other questions come in to the chat, I'm sorry, to the Q&A box, um, we're going to share on the screen an overview of the um, request for application webpage. So I, I know a number of you have likely visited that page already, but I just wanted to go ahead and run through some of the downloadable resources. We've included some of those in the chat, but they all exist on the webpage on the on Native American Agriculture Fund.org website. Um, so on the screen here, a member of our team is going to share uh, share the web page. Just one moment here, if you want to bear with us. Thank you, Gabby. So when you come to our homepage, you'll click on the apply now, or you can go into the grants and drop down menu at the 2024 RFA. Okay, so on this webpage, when you uh, scroll down, you'll see all of the information on the deadlines. Um, you'll see the buttons there to view the general and youth application. Also the, the link to apply for the application via the Foundant grant system, which that was a question that came through about uh, navigating that Foundant. So again, just as a reminder, I put that resource in the tutorial in the chat box, but if you have any technical questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and email us or contact us via phone. So um, below this deadline here, you'll see on a contact information and that has our phone number there. But in this um, box you'll see on the screen, I think this is a really helpful resource because there's different tabs here. So you will, here's like intro uh, language, but then you can go to see eligibility. Um, is your organization eligible for our funding? You also can look at uh, the next tab that says funding areas. And this uh, provides more information on what um, different organizations and eligible entities can apply for. On the next tab is what I think would be a really helpful resource for you all is the downloads. So I would recommend starting with the RFA overview document. This provides really just a general information that you need. We also had questions here, for example, about some of the budget guidelines, direct costs, indirect costs, overhead, all of that. So uh, that would be in the budget guidelines. You can download all of the budget narratives and sample budgets. Um, all of our frequently asked questions. Um, another one is the found application tutorial. We even have a technical uh, support here of like how to reduce your PDF file size. So if you're going to, to submit like support letters, for example, and you need to feel like you need, like, reduce the size of those, um, that's there available to you. The next tab is a checklist. And that checklist will tell you all of the required documents that you'll need before submitting your application. Um, the webinars tab is less uh, less um, applicable at this moment just because we're on our last webinar, but then we also have a deadline reminder there. So uh, those, below that are video tutorials. That is the NAF uh, financial tutorial series. Um, I recommend you check those out if you have any questions about finances. And then below there, we have all of our frequently asked questions. And I will you will see as we scroll through, that is a significant number of questions We've done our best to kind of break them up into different categories, um, but we also, if you uh, are curious about what other questions were asked during each webinar, we go through and add those into our frequently asked questions, but we also post each webinar uh, that we've had, um, and that includes a more in-depth presentation. Um, we also have one separate for our youth uh, application, so people can check, check that webinar out as well. Thank you so much, Gabby, for showing that. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to continue to submit via the question box. And I would like to just um, note that if anyone here has questions about the limited waiver of sovereign immunity, this is the best time to ask that question, as we do have NAF's legal expert Travis Trueblood here to answer those questions live. Okay. 
Okay, does anyone have any questions about eligibility, uh, the sovereign immunity waiver, navigating the found it system, or where to find more information? So we do have our first question. Hi, can you talk about what the waiver will be for? And I'd like to throw that over to Travis. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, everybody. Um, so per the requirements of NAFS Charter, which is our operating document, uh, it's called the trust agreement. The trust agreement requires NAF to seek and obtain from each um, tribal entity who applies or a, a sub-entity of a tribe a limited waiver of sovereign immunity uh, during the course of the time that the grant is in place um, to ensure that basically the the grant agreement can be enforceable. Um, there's no set limited waiver of sovereign immunity that NAF requires. We do have a, a example that we share freely with people if, they, if they'd like to consider using it. Um, well, we're also willing to look at one if they're if they're proposing one before their tribal council that they'd like them to pass so they can enter into the grant process. And in a, the grant agreement, we will review it for you to make sure and give you some assurance that NAF will, in fact, accept it. Um, but the basic notion behind it is that grant has a, or that NAF has a way to enforce the grant agreement provisions uh, if for some reason they, they weren't followed. Um, I know that's a, a little bit scary and intimidating, but please know that, you know, in all the times that NAF, all these years NAF's been in existence, we haven't had to use that one time yet. Um, but we're here as a resource for you to help you through this process and try to make it as easy as possible when you're making your application, when you're completing the grant agreement, and ultimately when you're fulfilling all the obligations of the grant. Thanks, Graham. Thank you very much, Travis. I'm going to move over to our next question. It says, not sure if this is the right box. But is an NPO eligible to submit a regranting project? I see native CDFIs can do regranting. And the answer is yes, that nonprofit organizations are eligible and able to do regranting. All, in fact, all of our eligible entities are able to uh, perform regranting. Okay. Next is, we're hoping to start a tribal agricultural cooperative. It's not directly related to climate resiliency per se, but is definitely community resiliency. Would it be eligible for that special focus? And I'm going to say that it really depends. I, I think that if you are able to put that into the general focus category, that would be a stronger category for that type of project. If you do submit it in your climate resiliency um, focus area, then we would definitely need to see the connections made between climate resiliency and creation of a tribal ag co-op and why the climate focus area is the right area for that funding to be applied in. Okay, I see another. I want to add one piece to that. Um, Absolutely. Just the question about the special focus area. If, if you all are are curious about what that is, our special focus areas this year are for climate and regenerative agricultural practices, um, but also additional CDFI and native CDFI support. But under the climate regenerative agricultural practices, um, that goes to supporting for climate and regenerative agricultural practices and disaster mitigation, and understanding that this funding can be used to assist producers or communities affected by climate-related disasters, uh, both natural and man-made, man but that, that impact and their engagement um, in the agricultural community food system work. So just a little bit more clarification on that, too. Thank you, Whitney. Next, I see, does the waiver of sovereign immunity need to be addressed in the cover letter from leadership? To which I, I would say, no, you don't need to, but that cover letter from leadership is a strong document. And so bringing up that waiver, I think would be good to understand leadership's um, position on that, but do know that it's not a requirement in order to be eligible for funding.
OK, and now I see uh, we were going through the grant application sections on the online form and didn't see a place to upload the budget. Is that something that will pop up after we fill out other parts of the grant questions? And so, yes, uh, that is how the application works. The online application, it fills out um, the application in response to what you put into it. And so once you have gotten far enough into the application to say what your eligible entity type is and what type of projects that you're wanting to apply for, then you will begin seeing questions pop up that ask you to fill out the narrative, fill out your impact, as well as upload a proposed budget and budget narrative. So as you proceed through the application, it will continue to populate questions that respond to what you're putting in. Okay, next we have, can you talk about the eligibility of urban agriculture for this grant? And I'll just blanket say that urban agriculture is an eligible funding area for funding with NAF. And one thing to add there too, is when you're submitting your application, thinking about um, in, in the context of urban agriculture, how that impacts and serves Native American producers too, and, and increasing their access to capital. So always coming back to that core of how will you expand access to capital for those Native producers. Thank you, Whitney. Um, Okay, so we are currently have no more open questions. I definitely hope folks submit more. I love the Q&A period. Ah, here we go. All right, so we are a 501c3 fiscal sponsor of the ranches that we are working with. And that also means our leader is not the ranch's leader. If we were to provide a cover letter, can this letter be from our CEO? To which I would say, yes, uh, the CEO of the applicant organization, in this case, the 501c3, it was, is who you want that cover letter to come from. Uh, I would also recommend, if you can, getting uh, letters of support from those ranches that you intend to work with. Um, the are, letters of support are not required, but they are very helpful for us to better understand who it is you're working with and their own thoughts on your working relationship. So they help add context, and that's always really helpful for us to better understand the reach and intent of your project. Okay, we are currently sitting at no open questions. So once again, I urge anyone who has questions, especially about that limited waiver, to uh, please pose them here. Okay, is the trust mandatory, trust agreement mandatory for all applicants? And I'm gonna hand that off to Travis. Thanks, Graham. The, the trust agreement is only governs NAF's con, con, uh, conduct as an entity. Um, the grantees are asked to enter into a, a grant agreement with NAF that intends to spell out all the specifics of the arrangement between NAF as the granting party and your entity as the grantee and how you will carry out um, your plan and spend the grant money. But the trust agreement itself only pertains to NAF. Thank you very much, Travis. And um, just in addition to that, the limited waiver is also specific for, for tribes. And so if you are any other type of eligible entity type, then the limited waiver of sovereign immunity will not apply to you. In terms of, uh, I see, I'll answer this question before I go to yours, uh, Pinu. Is there a link to info on the limited waiver? And there is, it is on our website. I highly recommend giving that document uh, a read through to better understand what our requirements are. And it also will contain a uh, template waiver. 
And that is something that we put in there to help jumpstart the process of getting the limited waiver um, rolling. And if you have any additional questions about that limited waiver, I highly recommend posting them here and now while we have uh, Travis here. I'm also going to drop the link in the chat. Um, I'm going to link to first the RFA overview document. And on page seven of that document, it does go into more detail about the limited sovereign immunity waiver. Perfect. Next, we have our di grant, direct grants, small grants to tribal farmers, an acceptable or desirable way to provide access to capital. And that is an eligible project activity. Um, I can't say whether it's desirable or not, because it really depends on the situation, on what your organization does, what its history is with regranting. So again, that's very context dependent, but we have plenty of grantees that have made regranting to farmers an activity. And I'm going to field this next question over to you, Whitney, but I'll read it out. Are there any requirements for ownership of intellectual property to outcomes or any potential products generated from the grantees projects supported by this grant? You know, that's a really great question. I might see if Travis can weigh in on this too, but um, I'm going to maybe have to look up the answer to this question uh, and get back to you. Uh, we'll email you, but unless Travis is able to jump in and answer this. I, I'm sorry, I cut out for a minute. Could you repeat the question? Absolutely. Are there any requirements for ownership of intellectual property to outcomes or any potential products generated from the grantees projects supported by this grant? Um, it, there's nothing in NAF's agreement that uh, the NAF's grantee agreement that would convey any type of ownership to NAF for anything that the grantee might develop during the course of their grant. Thank you. And um, I will also say that the grant agreement will cover uh, some of this stuff as well. And so if you are interested in um, seeing what the grant agreements look like, we do on a case-by-case -case basis offer um, a blank template that shows some of our legal language. Ingram, because we had a couple of questions come through about addressing access to capital, I just wanted to provide a quick overview that because of the central issues that led to NAF's creation involved access to capital, NAF does require that all applications incorporate different strategies that will improve access to capital for native farmers and ranchers. Uh, so access to capital can be shown through a number of ways. Um, some examples could be, for example, business planning or market planning, training, financial education, credit education um, for students, record keeping, uh, credit repair activities, different targeted credit application training or technical support, uh, risk analysis or related activities to prepare native farmers and ranchers as they seek capital to support to support their enterprises. So really it, it ranges, but we're going to drop a link in the chat um, that goes into that a little bit more in detail as well, which is a, a video on access to capital. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Whitney. There are still room for additional questions. We don't have any questions in our Q&A box. And I say keep them coming because these have been some very, very good questions. And just as a reminder, I know we've we've shared a lot of different links into the chat, but all of these links I'm sharing can be found on that original web page that we went through earlier to, uh, today. And that is on our web page, Native American Agriculture Fund.org.
until we receive any further questions, Whitney, um, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to you just to see if there's any other items you might want to address on this webinar. Yeah, so um, I do want to provide a, a quick overview. We had one more question come in, but um, a member of our team here, um, Riley, I'm going to turn over to you in just a moment, but I want to give a, a plug for uh, another funding opportunity with one of our partner organizations. It's called the Sovereign Equity Fund, and, and they have uh, their own request for application period open uh, at the same time, but their deadline is a, is past the May 1st, I believe, um, July 1st. So I'll have Riley confirm that here in a moment. But it's called the Cultural Foodways Fund, and that is uh, available for tribal colleges and universities. So, Riley, can I turn that over to you just to provide a quick overview of what that application looks like? Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Riley Dizatel. I'm an Associate Grants Officer here at NAF. Um, I'm in the 501c, or not the 501c3, sorry, I've been spitting out too many organizations today. I'm in the educational organization uh, inbox, so I'm a POC for those grantees, um, but I also do some work with our sister organization, as Whitney mentioned, the Sovereign Equity Fund. Uh, they currently have a grant open through tribal colleges and, tribal colleges and universities that want to focus on projects in arts, arts and humanities uh, in native food ways. So we funded projects that um, <clears throat> this last year, we have six grantees in that cohort, first cohort, and then this is gonna be the second. So um, we funded projects in uh, that are doing workshops with drum making and recipe books, um, anything in that realm, as well as uh, Connecting, um, connecting traditional foods to uh, cultures. So uh, making rice makers and then going out into the harvest seasons and uh, doing that wild rice harvest. Uh, same thing, you know, bow making um, and then going and going and doing an elk camp. So we we're doing different things and we're excited to have six new grantees this next year. And like Whitney said, that is open through July 1st, 2024. Um, and yes, we'll drop some information. Thank you, Sam, for the website. And again, very similar, um, similar application and such. So anything you guys may need, please reach out to grants at sovereignequityfund.org. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Riley. And and uh, that chat or that um, resources in the chat there as well. All right. Um, any other um, updates from our team, Chanel? Do you have any other closing thoughts here? Um, no, just uh, a reminder. I know that those um, point of contacts were dropped into the, the chat. So if you are a current grantee and you have some questions about um, past reports, please reach out to your point of contact via that specific email there. If you have new questions, if you're a new applicant, please feel free to reach out to the grants at um, inbox and we will do our best to get questions answered um, in a timely manner. Thank you so much. So we'll stay here um, for a little while longer unless any other questions come through um, until the top of the hour. But just as a reminder for the deadline um, that you won't, there will not be an opportunity to edit or amend after the deadline has passed. So definitely encourage you to try to get as much uh, information complete before that day. Um, but again, our team will be available to answer any questions leading up to the deadline. Whitney, I did see three more questions pop up that we hadn't um, discussed verbally. If you don't oh, mind me. Yes, absolutely. Them. I'm sorry. I think I may have missed those. So yes, go ahead. Uh, so one came from the chat and two came from the Q&A. So I'll read the two from the Q&A first. Those were already answered uh, by Chanel. Thank you, Chanel. But just for the uh, folks who might be listening at home, in case we are not able to submit this year, will this grant be open next year? 
the answer is that yes, it will open up around the same time next year. And so for reference, this year, uh, our grant opened March 1st and closes May 1st at 11.15 at midnight uh, central time. And then would you also allow multi-year projects for new applicants or as a new applicant, should we only submit a request for a single year of funding? And in the application, you are able to select two um, options, either a 12 month project or a 24 month project. And being a new applicant, it doesn't matter. You can select whichever one is applicable to your project. Next, we have uh, Doris from the chat. If we, we are a 501c3, if we wanted to help them set up a community garden, would that qualify? And so there's a few different layers to this question. In terms of helping someone set up a community garden, it depends on what that help looks like. Um, if you are interested in fiscally sponsoring another organization, that other organization does need to be attempting to acquire its own 501c3 status, including applying for that status from the IRS, having submitted the application. If you are interested in helping a community broadly set up a community garden, then I would say that the most important thing for you to list in your application is how setting up that community garden is also increasing the ability for uh, native farmers and ranchers to access capital. That access to capital piece is the linchpin in any and all projects that NAF takes part in. The last thing I'll say is that um, for any of the folks in the chat that uh, Dr. Joe Graham did drop some language from our previous grant agreements um, that do touch on intellectual property and effectively saying that any intellectual property resulting from the project shall, as between the parties, be the property of the grantee unless otherwise agreed to in writing by the grantor. The grantee must also take reasonable steps to make relevant materials available to the public at no charge or at a minimal charge. All right, so we are currently out of open questions. And so, as Whitney said, we will be here until the top of the hour, uh, but I highly recommend that any folks that have any remaining questions take this time to pose them here so that we can answer them live. I think we had one more question come through the chat. All righty. I'm with the national RC and D and we would sub grant to a local RC and D. Is that acceptable? Um, and so I'm going to assume, please let me know if I'm wrong, but uh, is that Resource Conservation District? Or um, please let me know what RC&D means otherwise. And if you are granted funds, uh, you are able to, to subgrant to another organization that is acceptable. Um, I will say that in terms of, okay, excellent. I will say that in terms of responsibility, uh, fiduciary responsibility, responsibility for the funds that whoever receives the grant, let's say it's your national RCD, that that organization is responsible for the expenses of that money and for the project activities. So just keep that in mind as you uh, apply. And here to confirm RC and D is resource conservation and development. Thank you, Doris. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, so we have about five more minutes. So unless you all have any more questions for us, uh, feel free to hop off. But again, our contact information is grants at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. And we can drop that email here in the chat one more time, but we'll stick around for four more minutes. I will take this last uh, moment to say that for any of y'all 
who are still interested in uh, applying for a grant with NAP, highly, highly, highly recommend getting that submitted before, uh, as soon as you can. I don't want to give a specific due date as to when it would be best, but do note that our system might be overloaded uh, with lots of folks trying to submit all at the very end. So if you're able to submit earlier than that, that would be extremely helpful, I think, for you in ensuring that your application it doesn't hit any technical hurdles, such as the system overloading or acting slow or anything like that. Um, highly recommend that as it is an issue that we see from time to time. Um, and it's just nice to get it out and know that it was submitted and that you still have some time. Uh, this is my recommendation there. I'd also like to read Travis's message to the general chat saying, thank you everyone for your participation. Please don't hesitate to reach out to him if you have any questions about the limited waiver of sovereign immunity or grant agreement. Note that any questions you send to grants at uh, will about the sovereign uh, limited waiver of sovereign immunity or the grant agreement will also be filtered over to Travis. So um, know that you'll get a response from there as well if you send something there. Okay, we have one final minute here before we end the webinar. If there are any other questions, um, feel free to submit those here, but we appreciate you being here. Just as a reminder, uh, we look forward to seeing your applications submitted by Wednesday, May 1st at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. Okay, thank you all for being here.